Well, good morning. Nice to see you. Glad you showed up. <clears throat> I, uh, I, I love the mission stuff. I, don't, I get so excited over what's happening all over the world. You know, you just either go or you send. It's like there's only two options. You just go or you send. And if you're really blessed, you get to do both. You to go now and then, and you get to send. And uh, we just, we really, really like the stuff that's going on. I, I tell people all over the world, I say, we have so many world changers in this church, but the ones that scare me the most are the women. I, I, we, have, we have ladies that make me nervous. They make me nervous. Tracy Evans was here first service. She just scares me. She, that lady scares me. Erica, these people, they make me nervous. They're all, they all make me nervous. It's, it's, I, I can't tell you why. They just scare me. They, they are so bold and courageous, and I love to see what they do, and it's just, it's just so much fun, so much fun. So check out the mission stuff. I just encourage you to do that. Mike and Lynn, you guys are really, really an asset to us. We're so glad you guys are here, so thankful. Take your Bibles and uh, join me on a journey. I don't know where we're going, but I hope to recognize it when I get there. I'll, I'm going to be a tour guide. And uh, I do have a few things in my heart that I want to share with you. We're going to go start with Exodus 14, of all places. And we're going to jump from there to Colossians 1. So maybe put uh, your bulletin or something in uh, Colossians 1. And um, we'll start in Exodus 14. I'm going to start with, with kind of a funny story. It's, I'm not going to actually teach on it. It just illustrates something that's, that's quite fun for me. Exodus 14, beginning with verse 13. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. I mean, think that's a good word. That's not near enough. I'm not sure you actually read this with me because you should be happy at this moment. I'll give you the clue when to be happy again. This is amazing news. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians, those, those tormenting situations, you're never going to see them again forever. Let me think it's, it's yeah. Yeah. I, I just needed to update the translation. It was all I needed to do. I love this promise. It was a, it was a great word that Moses brought to the nation of Israel. I don't know how many of you have had this happen. I think probably most, if not all. We have this sense in your heart of what God is saying. And you do your best to represent it. And when it's all said and done, you look back and you are about 80% right. Do you know what I mean? Or is it just Chris and me that have this one down? Chris, Chris and I do this all the time. We just try our best. We declare that word and it's about, it's, it's overall, it's good. It's, it, and it's almost like, uh, God, could you cover us on that other 20%? Because we, we really didn't know what we were talking about. Moses here brings a word to Israel. And he says, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see again forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you will hold your peace. I mean, I think that's a good word. Look, look at verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? All right, what does that tell us? Picture this. Moses is giving this word to Israel. Stand still. You're going to see the salvation of the Lord. He's going to fight for you. You won't have to do a thing. Just stand still. And then he turns to God. He's going, oh, God. Oh, oh God. It would be so cool if what I said just happened. It would be, it would be the coolest thing ever if what I said just actually happened. And God says, why do you cry out to me? Let's put it in different language. Moses, why are you praying The disciples experienced that, I'm sure, more than once. But one time that I remember, they came to Jesus, and they woke him up because he was sleeping in the, in the middle of a storm. And they woke him up and asked the Savior of the world this great question, don't you care that we're perishing? <laughs> to which he got up and calmed the sea, calmed the storm, and then turned to the disciples and said, how come you don't have any faith? Interesting question. I always thought my faith was seen in my prayer life. 
What were the disciples doing? Jesus is sleeping. They go wake him. Who's Jesus? He's God. What do you call conversation with God? Prayer. Are you with me? Don't you care that we're perishing? He gets up. He answers their prayer, stills the storm, and then turns to them and says, how come you don't have faith? Sometimes we're looking for him to answer a prayer for us instead of answer through us. So he speaks to Moses and he says, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Does anybody recognize just a subtle difference between standing still and going forward? He got, he got the heart of the word right. You know, like, God's going to deliver you, but it's not going to be by standing still. There are certain seasons, times in our life, where the Lord will show up and show off and you do nothing. But there are other times he's not moving till you do. The answer is not in figuring out how he's going to move. That's part of our problem. Our life is not in the instruction, it's in the voice. About the time you learn how to give everything away, he'll tell you to open a savings account. Am I right? Why? Just because he can. His interest isn't in, you know, how much money I have in my pocket or bank or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, will I do what he said? That's the whole point. Life is in the voice. About the time you get one thing figured out, he changes the game. Just because he's God. To one person he says, you can't own a TV. And their really good Christian neighbor has five of them. We would prefer figuring out the appropriate legal response. Can we or can't we? Figure it out. If you can, how many? And, and, then, and then God just completely changes it. I like this. I think this is called fun. So he tells Israel, go forward, or Moses. Moses turns and he leads them into a victory. The waters part, they go into a great triumph, an extended season of unusual experiences and victories. The point being, it's required of us to learn how to have what I will refer to as elastic theology. Now, don't be offended because I will explain it and hopefully you understand what I mean. Uh, because if anyone takes that sound bite, as I'm sure somebody will, it's already done. <laughs> it's already done. Listen carefully. It's been tweeted already. That's awesome. Great. It's all right. I'm, I'm used to it. All right. L listen carefully. Jesus, there are absolutes in Scripture. Absolutes. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He's not a created being. Eternal Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He became the ultimate, perfect, and only offering possible to redeem humanity. His blood was shed to cover and atone for the sins of mankind. He died. He rose after three days. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back for a glorious church. These are absolutes. They don't change. There's nothing about them that will change. But here's the issue. As we learn on this journey about prayer, about giving, about fasting, about praise, about you, you, you name it, relationships, how to 
you know, everything that we do in the Christian life, just the rest of the stuff, all of that stuff is elastic as we learn how to live it. God will never violate his word, but he does not mind violating our understanding of his word. I personally think he enjoys it. About the time I think I have it figured out, we fast. He says, don't fast. And by the time I am finally thankful to be through with the fasting lifestyle, he says, fast. Why? Because the life is in the voice. It's, in, it's in obviously in yielding to what he has said. All right, does the Bible say you have a free will? Yeah, this, this, you're acting like this is a trick question. I, I know I've already set you up, and I'm so sorry. I apologize in advance. There's no trick questions that I can think of offhand. And I probably won't warn you if there is, but this one isn't. It's not a trick question. Does the Bible say, whosoever will may come? <laughs> uh, does the Bible say you have a free will? Yes, yes. Does the Bible say you're predestined? Hmm. Isn't that a bummer? Because what we would rather do is pick one, stick with it, and disprove the other. That's how we create enemies in the kingdom. As we, we pick our favorite side, build a theology around it, and just explain away the other side. Here's the deal. There are times where the, the most important word you could hear is that God has it handled. You've been predestined. You can't fail at what he's assigned you to do. There are, there are certain moments in your life when that word is the word that will put you at ease. But here's what I've found out about the Lord. As soon as you've learned how to rest, I mean, a rest is not inactivity. As soon as you've learned how to rest, he says, get to work. It's not because he's confusing or he's trying to confuse you. As soon as you learn how to rest in his work, he says, get to work. Why? Because then your work is based on his work. There's a great difference in working for favor and working from favor. This is old territory, I understand, but I'm trying to put it in a context today. What I've, what I've watched people do in the last uh, few years is, is that they will study hard, come up with a definition of love. For example, I addressed this last week. Come up with a definition of love, and through that definition, they will redefine what the Bible says. You can't allow your definition of love or grace or any of the glorious words that we that are our favorites for us, you can't allow a definition to form in you that twists your way of reading Scripture. In other words, you can't, <laughs> you can't read this definition of love and go, well, then hell makes no sense, so obviously there's no such thing. No, the Bible says there is. So you have to allow the Scriptures to establish your definition of what love is, what it looks like. Right? that same father will come to you in one season and say, I've got this one covered. Today you get to stand by and watch my salvation. And the next season he comes to you and says, if you don't move, I'm not moving. And we like to write books around either one of those. But both are true. This conflict goes all through the Bible. I, it's been a while since I've done this, but I, I love the scriptures that talk about advancing in the kingdom. Here's, here's one. Matthew 11. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. In that scripture, how do you progress in the kingdom? Violence. Faith is violent in the unseen world. How do you progress? Well, it's obvious. It's faith. It's aggressive pursuit of what God has promised. That's the way you advance. 
And then Jesus says, unless you become like a child and receive the kingdom as a child, you can't enter it. Well, well, which one is it? Is it, is it violence or do, I, or do I receive it? Do I, do I go get it or does it come to me? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's, that's the beauty of this relationship. Is he, he doesn't want you to figure it out. We tend to overemphasize whatever we learned last. The Lord spoke real specifically to me 16, 17 years ago in this outpouring that we've been experiencing. And, and I had just, it's just a, a personal word. It does, it does affect the call and the life of, of Bethel, this, this house. The word is very specific. It was my responsibility to make sure that at least where I have influence, this remained a grace revival. Grace, grace, huge theme. Now I'm watching people redefine grace, and I'm going to stop that. <laughs> stop that. You're messing things up. That's, that's not grace at all. I hear people say, well, we don't, we don't pray anymore. We don't ask the Lord for anything because, because he knows our needs. Well, that's awesome. But in Matthew 6, he said, the Father knows what you have need of before you ask. The very next verse, when you pray, pray like this. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It is specific prayer for what he already knows you need. Why? It's important that our mouth lines up with his purpose. It's not that we need to persuade him. It's that we need to co-labor with him to see certain things happen on the planet that he wants to have happen. And so the Lord puts these things all through Scripture where where these, they look like contradictions, but they're not. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. It's like they just work best together. This, this book was written in such a way that you can't really know it outside of a relationship. It was, it was meant to be interpreted through intimacy. One of the great tragedies in life is the scripture gets interpreted by people who are not in love. You're not in love because you read it. You're in love because you know him. There's, there's ongoing encounter. It doesn't mean I have the right to interpret this to fit my, my, my circumstances. But what it means is in this relationship, he makes it come alive. He just does. And this issue of grace is, is, uh, is so, such a big deal to maintain the standard of grace. But this is what grace looks like. I, I hear people say, I don't need to pray anymore. Well, we don't fast anymore because Jesus fasted. It's all, it's, he already accomplished everything. That's true, he did. He accomplished everything. But he didn't accomplish everything so that you could accomplish nothing. Here's, here's, this is funny. Jesus, only Jesus could get this across the way he does. He comes along, he says, <clears throat> you say, thou shalt not murder. I thought God made that one up. But anyway, he says, you say, you can't murder. He says, I say, you can't call someone a name. The, he's introducing grace. I'll try this side. He's, he's, he's instructing on great, I, I laugh, people say, well, we, we're not bound by law, we're, we're, we're under grace. Yeah, that's awesome. Have you read the Bible lately? What grace looks like? 
He says, you say, do not commit adultery. But I say, don't look on a woman with lust. What is he saying? Grace is a lot harder than law. <laughs> I'm sorry to depress you. I've, I've, I've got good news for you, though. I really do. I really do. But here's, what is grace? Grace has been, uh, most common definition, a merited favor. I, I love the subject of grace. We've studied this for years. It's been a huge part of my life, my own journey. What does this grace thing look like? Um, I love Ephesians. Uh, it's my favorite book on grace. Uh, it says it's going to take the ages to come to unravel just the beginnings of this mystery of grace. So like 100 billion years from now, you will have scratched the surface. You will have had a good start on this amazing subject of grace, all right? And he goes on and he says, Paul says of himself, he says, I was made a minister according to the gift of grace. Made a minister. Picture grace as being two hands and your life being a lump of clay and he shapes you. How? Grace shapes you. Every experience you have of divine favor shapes you. But that favor is not just, I like you, and I'm going to show you my kindness. It's, it's not just that. Grace is actually the empowering presence of God that has been given to you as a gift. So this is why Jesus can say, you say you shall not commit murder, but I say, don't even call somebody a name. Why? Because in law, you were required to perform. In grace, a presence is released to you that enables you to do what only he can do. The connection of grace is the connection to the presence of God himself. Paul says, I was made a minister according to the gift of grace. And then he talks about his actual ministry of releasing presence and power is the ministry of grace. Is this confusing? Is this making sense? Grace, grace, this, this thing shaping our lives with grace. Look at this passage, if you would, over in Colossians, because this one's a real mystery verse to me. I, I love it, uh, and for a long time I didn't. I'm not sure if it's legal to not like a verse in the Bible, but if it's legal, I didn't like this verse. If it's not legal, I don't know what to tell you. It wasn't my favorite. Verse uh, Colossians 1, <clears throat> verse 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. That's the phrase that always bothered me. I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Just think with me now. It would be an error to think that you and I could suffer. Now, I need to mention, when aff the afflictions of Christ is not mentioning disease, affliction in that context. We know that Jesus wasn't sick. <clears throat> if becoming sick would have brought a breakthrough for you and me, Jesus would have been the sickest person on the planet, but he wasn't. So Jesus, Paul says, I'm filling up in my own body what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ. It would be an error to think that you and I could suffer persecution, because that's, that is the reference. You follow it through. We could suffer any kind of opposition or persecution, maybe even physical harm, and that would work in any way redemptively towards humanity. There is no suffering that you and I can do that has any role whatsoever in redemption. Are, are, are you with me on that? In fact, I'll tell you what, there, there is a, a thought going around that scares me a bit, and that is that Jesus went to hell and suffered in hell. If Jesus went to hell and suffered in hell, then his death and the shedding of his blood was not sufficient to set us free from sin. He went into the lower parts of the earth, but only to make to lead captive those who have been bound by the law that have now been set free. It, it's, a, it's a long story, but it's, it's when he went, he went to pronounce liberty and freedom to those he had shed blood for. Amen. 
Amen. <laughs> so there's no suffering that you do to redeem for somebody else. That's out of the picture. But what is being talked about here? That we, he would fill up in his own flesh a, the, what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ. I think it's the fellowship of his sufferings that Paul talks about elsewhere. It's the fact that there is such a union with Christ that whether I get to celebrate triumph and victory or I run into deep, heavy opposition because I bear the name, both are a privilege. I teach, I teach most about what we get now. I, I, I teach, here, let me give you a phrase. I heard this phrase, I think the first time in the early 80s, uh, a book was written by a wonderful man of God from Buffalo, New York, pastor Tommy Reed. Name of the book was Kingdom Now But Not Yet. And I absolutely love that phrase. I loved, I loved it to pieces. I was so thrilled because I, I finally woke up to the fact that the kingdom is not just eternity future, but it's now. And so we started asking a question. All right, what does it look like to actually taste of that then, now? And so we began to look at Scripture. We started to see, oh, well, Jesus healed people, and he trained his disciples to do the same. There was this ongoing work that was to continue after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And so I started to see that there is a present tense reality of the kingdom that is supposed to be increased and demonstrated. And... Uh, in, in examining the now part, I, I, that phrase seemed to liberate us into thinking what might be possible in our lifetime. And, and that phrase was used to, to put a whole bunch of people free and to say, you know what, it's not just eternity, it's not just heaven, it's now. But most of the time I hear that phrase in the last, oh, I would say 15 years anyway. Most of the time I hear that phrase used now, it's always to tell me what I can't have now. In other words, it's used as a statement to say, yeah, you can hope for things, but you know, it's not all going to work out, and you'll just have to adjust because it's just not all God's will for it to work out now. Uh, you know, that person, that your relative that you prayed for, we don't know why, but God works mysteriously. It was just his will for them to suffer through that torment of cancer and die, and, and the Lord took him home. Yes to the Lord took him home. Yea for that but to attribute the process to God's will is a violation of the standard that Jesus set. Why did it happen? I'm clueless. We obviously haven't arrived, but I'm not blaming him. The standard Jesus set is not complicated. It is hard, but it's not complicated. He healed everyone who came to him, period. He purchased the payment for everyone that would ever suffer, period just as he made an adequate payment for every person to be born again. I don't know why many things happen the way they do, but I'm not going to blame it on, on him. When this phrase is used, kingdom now but not yet, it's generally used in recent days to tell me what we can't have now and why we just have to settle for less. That ticks me off. I've, I've, I've told you here before, it's been a few years now, but I've told this house before, I said, don't listen to anybody who tells you what you can't have now. So like 99% of the time, when I talk kingdom now but not yet, I'm talking now. But I want to take a moment to talk about the 1% the not yet. Why... Is this making sense? Is this kind of like a parable that everybody's lost in? This, this, he, like, oh, yeah, I'm sure he knows what he's talking about, but I'm clueless. It's, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus just seemed to enjoy messing with people. I mean, he loves people, but he just, he messes with me. He comes to the disciples and he says, uh, I'm going to put this all in my terms. So, he comes to the disciples and he says, uh, that money thing, it'll kill you. Yep, it'll kill you. 
it's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than it is to get a rich man to heaven. Just be careful of that money stuff. And then he goes on and he says, now if you're faithful with that money stuff, I'm going to give to you a hundred times more than what you, uh, I'm going to add to your life a hundred times what will kill you. <laughs> it, it's like, I, I'm not sure if I want it, if it's going to kill me. But, but then he adds, it's, it's, this, it's this unique phrase. He says, I'm going to give you a hundred times as much with persecution. It's that last phrase that won't let anybody put that promise into heaven because there'll be no persecution in heaven. Are, are you tracking with me here? He says, this is what I want to do. You be faithful here. This stuff will kill you. I'm just telling you right now, it's, 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 this will kill you. This, this, this is dangerous. If you're faithful with it, I'll give you a hundred times as much. Okay, with persecution. Now, why did he add that part? Because that's what keeps us honest. honest I, 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 there's some, here, here's the deal. Here's the 1%. It is important that you and I face decisions consistently in our life where we make decisions because of how it affects eternity, not needing a breakthrough, a reward in time. God has become, in many people's minds, a vending machine that brings immediate gratification and reward. I am so thankful for the hundred times as much in this lifetime. I'm thankful for that. I've watched him do it. I'm amazed by what he does and how he does it. It, it, it amazes me. But it's vital that we keep in perspective eternity so that we can make decisions now in time that cost us for which there is no immediate reward. I'm telling you, a day is coming where the only thing that will matter <laughs> with you is the reward you have then, not what you enjoyed on earth. You've heard the, the phrase, we are human beings, not human doings. We've got to learn to be. That's true, but you'll never get rewarded for being. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. I just felt good to say. I don't know how it affects you. I just, I'm quite happy reading that. We sure haven't got very far in this chapter in, in Colossians. Let's jump through this real quick because I want to wrap this up. I'm going to fill up in my flesh what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of the body. That's the fellowship of his sufferings. Verse 23. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does that mean? There's been a mystery that has been hidden in the person of God, has been there for eternity. That mystery started to be unfolded here. And the mystery is Christ in you is the hope of glory. When Jesus said, this is the standard of law, and my standard is here. And the reason this is better than this is because the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you and makes you capable of doing what's impossible to do. It's not just the enabling presence. It's the fact that you have become a new creation in which he could deposit that presence. The Bible actually teaches that a believer is a new race of people. A new race, a chosen race, not an elitist race. It's one that everybody's invited to. Adopted into the family of God, inheriting his own nature, inheriting his own grace that permeates his own presence, that permeates through our lives. This whole, this whole thing in Psalms, there's this passage that says, uh, this will be given to a, to a generation yet to be created, is the phrase. A generation yet to be created. There's never been a new creation of humanity since Adam and Eve in the garden until people got born again and Paul stood up and he said, you're a new creation. Grace 
is the enabling presence of God that takes up residence in a person, enabling them to live above human standards. That is grace. That's why Paul rebuked the church at Corinth, because they were acting human. He says, you're acting like mere humans. (laughs) It's the truth. It's in there. Just go look it up. He says, you're acting like mere humans. People without the Spirit of God could do that. But when God takes up residence in you, a standard, a different standard is put into place. It's not a standard of harshness and judgment. It's a standard of enablement. Chris has done a great job on this through the years to remind us that we're not just sinners saved by grace. That's not our identity. That's our past, but it's not our present. The Scripture teaches quite clearly that we have been made saints created in his likeness, in his image, filled with his own presence, and he expects something different. But when the mind is locked into old patterns instead of who he says we are, it's really difficult to produce anything but old patterns. It's not mind over matter. It's the renewed mind that enables, you know, the renewed mind actually enhances the lifestyle of faith. Faith doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart. But the renewed mind enhances the lifestyle of faith. Here's, here's what I wanted to get to. I'm sorry. Verse 28. We preach, we, him we preach. That's a good sermon right there. Preach him. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in wisdom, in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Did you hear what Paul's saying? He's talking to a group of people he's responsible for. He says, my ambition is to present you perfect. That's a scary thought right there for two reasons. One is that leadership has responsibility for people. That makes me nervous. Leadership is responsible for people. Why? To present them. Verse 29, to this end I also labor, striving according to his working with works in me mightily. To this end I labor. What is this verse? This verse is grace. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working with works which works in me mightily. What's, what's, what's the deal? Rest from your works. Rest because of his, and then get to work. Don't buy into the nonsense, there's no more work. But just work because of his. Work because you're favored, not to get favored. Fast. Don't fast to pay a price. I've told you this recently again. I fast not to pay a price. I fast to refine my focus that I might fully apprehend what he has already purchased. I pray not to persuade him, but because he's commanded me and given me a pathway to walk where my mouth, my heart, my mind, everything co-labors with God so that his purposes are realized on the earth. Don't let some strange definition of grace take you away from what the Bible says to do. Amen. Why don't you stand? I was uh, reading through uh, first, second, third John here just recently, and I found this verse that kind of shook me a little bit. This is a P.S. that actually should be an entire message, but don't worry. Because I have you standing, I won't keep you there long. Um, Do you remember that Jesus lived in his three and a half years, his 33 years on planet Earth? That was actually technically Old Testament. Do you remember that? The New Testament wasn't until he died and the blood of the new covenant was shed. 
All right? So then that means his teaching was Old Testament. Which some have therefore concluded that his teaching is no longer for today. It was just for that period of time before he died, which is the dangerous boo-boo. I am going to read it to you. I'm glad you asked. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ. What, what teaching? His teaching. Does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, which is what teaching? The teachings of Christ does not bring this teaching. Don't receive him into your house. And don't even say hi. <laughs> I don't know about you. I think the red letters are pretty important. I've, 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 the, the, the red words in the Bible, what Jesus taught, are living oracles of God that shape how we're to think and how to value life. He released these things to us to bring us into full expressions of grace. I love when I see somebody sacrifice and God honors them and promotes them. But Paul took the church at Corinth through an interesting thing. He says, I've heard that some of you are taking other brothers and sisters to court to sue them. And he says this, he says, why not rather be wronged? Why would you take a family squabble to be judged by those outside the family? If you can't get it settled, why not just choose, I'd rather lose than lose? I'd rather lose here than lose there. Not heaven or hell, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, doing something. I, I don't believe in eternal insecurity. I'm, I'm, I'm not into that. <laughs> but I'd rather lose here. Sometimes you just make a decision that, you know what? I know I'm right. But to prove it would cost too much. I'd rather be wrong. It's, it's just what you do. Okay. Help us, Jesus. Help us. That was such a positive note to end on, too. So, such a, such a positive note. So, Jesus, help us. Put your hand on somebody next to you and say, Jesus, they really need help. I've, I'm so glad they were here today to hear this word. They really need your help. Father, we do pray for just a real grace to live in grace and to uphold the beauty of grace without it being defiled by godless logic. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Let these champions of grace impact the world once again this week. Amen. Amen. Paul, why don't you come on up and wrap this up? Please.